Well, welcome to uh, St. James the Great and the Great Manor Museum for our five-week study on Islam and um, its relationship to Christianity and Judaism. I'm Reverend Cindy Voorhees for you visitors, so thank you and welcome, uh, welcome uh, with being here tonight. Um, I will uh, introduce our guest speaker in a moment, but I'd like you to know that the format is about 45-minute discussion uh, from Iman Jihad Turk, and then there'll be a Q&A time for us to have a discussion. Um, housekeeping issue, uh, the restroom is behind you, behind, the, behind door number curtain one. <laughs> and um, I've been told to announce that the coffee tonight is decaf, so that if you would like some coffee, it is decaf. Um, I'd also like to thank the hospitality crew tonight and set up takedown team. Really great job. And thank you for also preparing food that uh, uh, we all could eat, including um, jihad. It's halal food was wonderful. Leo, where are you? Take a bow, please. <laughs> um, so our guest speaker, Iman... Jihad Turk, I'm going to try to read this, it's a little blurry here. Uh, Jihad is the president of the Bayan Claremont Islamic Graduate School and former imam and director of the religious affairs at the Islamic Center of Southern California. He has dedicated the past decade to improving the relations between Muslims continuing, conti continuing and their faith tradition in Southern California. Having been the born to a Muslim Palestinian father and a Christian American mother, in Phoenix, Arizona, Jihad spent his college years traveling the world, Muslim world and ex exploring his roots in the Islamic tradition. In 2010, he founded the nation's first accredited Islamic seminary, Bayan Claremont. Let's welcome Jihad to our group. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Yes, you have the courage to invite jihad into your sanctuary. Um, it's my great honor to be here. It, you know, I have to say that um, I, my mother, as you heard, is, is Christian. And, and uh, with a name like jihad, uh, you might suspect that I might get a hard time. But I have to tell you that, uh, well, growing up, first of all, in Phoenix, Arizona, People had no clue about <laughs> Islam or Muslims, and so, you know, then there wasn't a lot of diversity in Phoenix in the 70s when I grew up, uh, and so you were either black, white, or Mexican, and so people just assumed that I was uh, Mexican with an exotic Mexican name, Yihad. <laughs> Maybe it's Oaxacan or something, and uh, so, so it, but, and you might think, well, I might, you know, as Jihad became more uh, well-known in, in, uh, in, in common consciousness in the United States, that there might be some kind of a negative affiliation, but I have to say I'm reaffirmed in my both American identity, even despite what you might hear in some uh, election year cycles of with politicians using uh, Islam and Muslims as a as a as a wedge issue. Uh, my personal experience has been very positive, and so uh, to be invited here, I think, reflects the Christian spirit that I've know, I've come to know and love. Uh, and the, the openness and the curiosity. I would have to say that my experience has not been one of hostility, but has been one of curiosity, and uh, it has made me a walking teaching moment. So, uh, so it's in that spirit that I, that I come here today uh, to share with you my perspective and uh, to uh, hear what it is that you have questions and concerns about, and... Uh, and uh, um, uh, we, we can, I think, come to know each other a little bit better and, and by doing so create a better society here and a better world ultimately. So I wanted to um, start with, I have two different PowerPoints. So I'm going to start with this one just for a quick second because I want to uh, walk you through. I taught at UCLA for a decade uh, Arabic language, Islamic studies, and so I'm going to put on my Arabic uh, language and, uh, instructor hat. And I'm going to say that you can, for, you can forget everything I'm about to teach you except for this one thing, which is the greeting in Islam, which is simply, Assalamu alaikum. So I'm going to have you repeat after me three times. And I say that because this is kind of, even though only one 
uh, 15% of the Muslim world, so, so Muslims make up one-fourth of the world's population, 1.7 billion. Uh, half of Africa is Muslim. There are 60 million Muslims in China. They're, you know, uh, 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 the largest Muslim, most populous Muslim country is Indonesia. Um, you're a very uh, uh, informed crowd, so you know all of this. But, and only 15% speak Arabic, but all 1.7 billion use this greeting. So this is kind of your, your passport to the Muslim world. So uh, we're about to stamp the passport today. All right, so repeat after me, uh, and there will be a quiz at the end. So here's the... Uh, <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. All right, I gave you the watered down version because actually this A is, an, is a letter that we don't have in English, and I grew up only speaking English, so it took me a few years to get it down. I don't expect you to get it tonight, but some of you might have it intuitively. It's an ayn. Ah, yes, that's a, that's a letter. All right, so you can, you can get by because most Muslims don't have the ayn in their letter, their vo vocabulary either, and so... You can get away with just pronouncing it as an A. So I'm going to say it with an A, but you can just say it with an A. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, there's a little bit of an ayn in there. I heard it. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. All right. Now, it, that's the greeting, and the response is almost the same, but in reverse order. Wa alaikum assalam. However, you can get by with just throwing back the greeting at the person who's giving it to you. So you could say, Assalamu Alaikum, and you could just say, Assalamu Alaikum, and you're good to go. So we're going to stop there. Uh, but one last time. Ready, set? Assalamu What was it? All right. Very good. All right. You guys pass. All right. So um, I thought I would... Uh, Oh, let me do one other thing from the other slide. So I want to I do quite a bit in this limited time that I have with you here. So if you would, bear with me. I'm going to walk you through the story of Islam. And what I mean by that is the story of creation, the story of how Muslims, how we perceive God and how we perceive ourselves and the relationship between us and God and one another. So I'm going to tell the story of Islam, the story of creation from the Islamic scripture, from the Quran, uh, as a point of departure. So we have that as a foundation. Then I'm going to talk about the verses um, uh, that deal with interfaith relations and how Muslims see Christians and Jews in particular. Uh, and then we'll talk about why Muslims want to kill you, all right, <laughs> which is really what you want to know. Yes, yes, all right. And... All right, you want to start with that one. But the reason why we're doing it in that order is so that at least we have a foundation upon which we can build some kind of, uh, you know, or at least a lens through which we can, you know, perceive accurately a polished lens that's in focus that we could, you know, use through which we could look to, to understand the Muslim world. All right, so bear with me. It's a little bit uh, of a, we're going to do some exegesis which I was just talking with uh, your wonderful pastor uh, or priest, and, and, and uh, you know, we agreed that you know, some of you might know and some of you might not that exegesis really has nothing to do with Jesus, uh, but it's just the, the exegetical, the, the hermeneutic by which you read Scripture. All right. So uh, quick three terms to get out of the way first. Islam is the name of the religion. Muslim is the one who follows the religion. So I'm a Muslim. I'm not an Islam or an Islamic. Um, and Allah is just the Arabic word for God, like you would say in French, Dieu, Dieu or in Spanish, Dios. Dios, and in Greek, no, just kidding, all right, <laughs> all right, so Allah, Jews who speak Arabic, Christians who speak Arabic refer to God when speaking Arabic as Allah, it's just, some Muslims like to keep the word Allah when speaking in English because it's special, but it's really just the Arabic word for God. All right, so the story of creation. Now, uh, this, book, this story of creation is told in the book of Genesis twice. It's also told in the Quran twice. But the first time you'll encounter it is in chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 30 through 39. So I'm going to walk you through these verses somewhat quickly. I'll pause and interject, and then, um, and then we'll get into the, the verses about Muslim, Christian, and Jewish relations. All right. And lo, 
Thy Lord said unto the angels, Behold, I am about to establish upon earth one who shall inherit it. Now, this is foreshadowing. God is telling the angels, I'm going to do this thing. Now, the angels, keep in mind, are in the Islamic theology, in, according to Islamic theology, angels are obedient. They have no free will. There is no fallen angel. Satan is not an angel. He comes up in the story in a little while, but he's considered a jinn. You guys might know the term jinni or genie, like I Dream of Genie, for those who are familiar with that show, show or for the younger ones, uh, Genie in a Bottle by Christina Aguilera. No. Uh, so, so jinni or genie actually comes from the Arabic jin, jinni and jinn. It's, it's kind of a other creation. So you have humans, you have angels, you have God, and then you have jinn. Now, jinn are sort of spirits, demon spirits, some good, some bad. Satan happened to be a bad one, uh, but he'll, he'll come up later. But I, I point this out because it's an important part of this narrative. So God says to the angels that are all good, Behold, I'm going to create humans. I'm going to create, establish upon earth one who shall inherit it. A vicegerent, a viceroy, a caretaker. The word is khalifa. And by the way, it's where we get the word California. You think I'm joking? Check out, check out Google. All right. There are three theories as to where we get California, but the, the word first appeared in a Spanish novel in the 17th century. Uh, but it, the Spanish novel, the same uh, root as the uh, well, separate... Good catch. Say that again. Is that a separate theory between Khalifa theory, or is it, is it the same root from Muslim and Islamic theory? Yeah, so, they, so the, the argument is that it came from the Spanish... Who, that have over 700 words in Arabic from, I mean, 700 words that are of Arabic origin. And the word caliph meant authority or ruler. It came up in that novel, California, but they suggest that the etymolo etymologically it comes from the word caliph. Uh, and, then, and then that it entered into the... 1507, so it would have had the Muslim root from the... In Spain. So, so Muslims, as you know, from the year 711 to the year 1492 ruled Spain. That's why so many Muslims work in 711. That's a, no, that's unrelated. That's unrelated. All right. So, uh, but, but most, for those almost, say, eight centuries, Muslims had a presence in Spain, and it wasn't until Ferdinand and Isabella remarried in the, and kicked the, the Jews and the Muslims out of Spain, and they went to Morocco. And Jews also were invited by the Ottomans. I was at the synagogue recently in Istanbul and attended a service there in which they still sing in Ladino, which is a Spanish dialect of Hebrew. So uh, in any case, going back to this idea, the word is caliph, uh, khalifa, um, and this is how God describes human beings, that we have this, we're inheriting the responsibility of the earth and those who live on it. So the, the Pope's encyclica on the environment actually resonates with uh, Muslims as well. And there was a, a, a conference on the environment that was a response to the Pope's encyclical, encyclical which took place shortly thereafter in Istanbul, in which Muslims reaffirmed the same uh, commitment to, theologically at least, to the environment and, and, and encouraged uh, states to be more ecologically conscious, conscientious. All right. So the angels, when they heard this news from God, objected. They said, what? You're going to create such as will, you know, and place therein such as will, you know, such as will spread corruption thereon and shed blood, whereas we extol your limitless glory and praise you and hallow your name. So, so they didn't get it. They didn't see the wisdom of God creating human beings because they're all obedient and they kind of suspected that if God created human beings, we'd be up to no good. They kind of had us pegged. They kind, of, they kind of had us pegged, but their complaint was, why are you going to do that? There's no purpose in it, right? That's kind of the, the complaint. And so God then tells them the reason why we're created. He says, I know that which you do not know. So it's an unsatisfying answer, but we see in what follows the wisdom of why God created human beings, and it has to do with this. So I'm going to unpack this because it's a little bit, um, there needs some exegesis. All right. And he imparted to Adam... The names of all things. That's an enigmatic statement. What exactly does that mean? To know the names of all things. So because of limited time, I'm just going to cut to the chase. This limited sentence, this small, these few words, is huge. 
What's implied here, according to chronic scholars, not just because of this, but because of the story that follows, what's implied here is that human beings were endowed with free will. And here's how we get from here to there. He taught Adam the, na the names of all things, meaning he taught humans language. In other words, he, when he created us, and this could, you can understand this allegorically, when God created human beings, whether we evolved or however, once we became humans, we had this faculty of language that's more sophisticated and nuanced than any other creation on this earth, any other animal species, right? So we have the, this advanced ability in language, which isn't just we can talk. It doesn't just help us communicate. It helps us think. And there have been studies. Any, I don't know if there's any physicians or linguists in the, in the room, but there have been studies that have shown and made a direct connection between one's ability to speak or to understand even if one is mute, but to be exposed to language and understand language and one's ability to actually think coherently. So what's implied here is that human beings have a higher order of logic and understanding and faculty of reasoning and, and, uh, and comprehension that then enables us to understand the consequences of our actions and our choices that then give free will meaning. That's a lot in a, in a short sentence, but that's, that's what the scholars understood is implied by that simple sentence and you can see from the story that unfolds, that's the emphasis of the story. So then he showed these things to the angels and said, you, you declare the names of these things if what you say is true. In other words, if what you are implying, that there is no wisdom in the creation of human beings, you demonstrate what human beings can do. Demonstrate free will, but also choose. Not just bad things, but good things uh, as well. So they replied, Limitless are you in your glory. We have no knowledge or no ability um, except that which you have uh, taught us. Verily, you alone are all-knowing and truly wise. So they conceded because they're all good. They're angels. All right. Then he said, showing off Adam, his newest creation, he says, O oh Adam, convey unto them the names of these things. And as soon as he did, then God says, I told you so, right? Uh, God then says, did I not say unto you, verily I alone know the hidden reality of the heavens and the earth and know all that you bring into the open and all that you would conceal? So here we have this ability. And again, in what follows, we're going to see this manifest. This is the, the, the pivotal characteristic of Adam and Eve uh, in the story that follows. It's the same story. You should know it. It's told with a slightly different narrative. So I'd like you to also notice the differences. So we told the angels, and here the we is a royal we. God is singular and one. There's no, that's the core of Islamic teaching. There is no hint of plurality of God. God is one. But when speaking in a majestic way, he refers to himself in the plural, and in an intimate way, speak, refers to himself in the singular. And when we told the angels, prostrate yourselves before Adam, they all prostrated themselves, except for Satan, who wasn't an angel, and in, a, in the, the second narrative in the, of the story of creation, it says explicitly, and he was a jinn. He was not an angel, he was a jinn. But here he was hanging out with the angels and included in the commandment to bow before Adam. So all the angels and Satan, who happened to be up there, uh, were instructed to bow before Adam. Not in worship of Adam, but in acknowledgement that there's a potentiality of Adam being the, and human beings, Adam being the archetypal human being, to... If employing free will to make good choices and to grow in one's character have the potential to be higher in rank even than the angels. So there's a potentiality that we have as human beings. And in acknowledgement of that, God instructed the, Adam, uh, the angels and Satan to, to prostrate. Now, Satan, he refused. He became arrogant and jealous and envious. And he became one of those who denied the truth. Now... And here the story continues. And we said, God says, O Adam, dwell you and your wife in this garden and eat freely thereof, both of you, whatever you may wish, but do not approach this one tree, lest you become wrongdoers. Two things on this one. Number one, where's the introduction for his wife? She's just all of a sudden part of the story. No rib, nothing, right? <laughs> That's true. She has no introduction. She's not even named. However... Follow her role in the story. Even though she's not given a grand introduction, she's also not scapegoated for what follows, and we all know what follows. All right. So it's, an it's not a trivial point because this actually deeply affected Islamic theology. 
and the role of women in theology from the beginning was set in part by this story and other verses in the Quran that, um, as I was sharing earlier uh, uh, over dinner, that uh, it, I would su suggest, despite the way Muslims treat women these days, Islam as a religion was a feminist, the a feminist uh, tradition. So uh, we can talk more about that later. So, and so we said, oh, Adam, uh, so, so, so number one is him, him and his wife, they can eat from the, wherever they want except for that one tree. What tree, what kind of tree was it? Apple, no. Oh. All right, the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of eternal life, the, you know, et cetera. So it's not specified in the Quran. They just were supposed to avoid that one tree. You know, I was on the, the History Channel uh, on a program called uh, The Garden of Eden. And it was myself and uh, Rabbi uh, Wolpe from, the Cedar, from Cedar Sinai, uh, from, Cedar, uh, from Sinai uh, Temple in Beverly Hills, and, an, and a local uh, pastor. And so it was an hour-long program on the History Channel that they asked us, tell us the narrative of Garden of Eden and all of that. So we did. It was a wonderful interview. And, uh, and so when I watched the program, uh, they spent five minutes summarizing our, our narrative and 55 minutes looking for the Garden of Eden. So <laughs> the History Channel's kind of, you know, it's not quite as, you know, um, you know, the standard of the History Channel has been low. I don't know if you've, it's been more, become more sensationalistic in my humble estimation, but they found it. A spoiler alert, they did find the... The Garden of Eden, it's where the Tigris and Euphrates meet under the, uh, what is now the Persian Gulf. That's what they said. I haven't gone there and checked myself, but it's on my bucket list. All right. So, so, uh, so, so they weren't supposed to eat from that tree. Guess what happens? All right. There's no serpent, but Satan himself tempted both of them. Satan caused them both to stumble. Satan came to both of them. Satan tempted both of them. They both succumbed to that temptation and, you know, so Satan and brought about the loss of their earth's wild state. So we said, God says, down with you, enemies unto one another, and on earth you shall have your abode and your livelihood for a while. So my question to you is, here we have a story so far, and you, first of all, you might say, well, Satan had a choice. You're right. Satan also had free will. Um, but he didn't have inheritance of the earth. The demon spirit, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't inherit the earth. He didn't have that responsibility. And so because Adam was given that responsibility, or humans, he was jealous and envious. All right, so here we have a scenario in which Satan disobeyed God and which Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Why are Adam and Eve so human and why are we so affectionate and loving of them and, and admiring of them? And Satan so satanic, uh, even though they all disobeyed God. What's the, dif what's the distinguishing between Adam and Eve on the one hand and Satan on the other? They were all disobedient. We, we expect evil from Satan. Okay. So there's an expectation. So he lived up to his expectation and, and Adam and Eve fell, fell short. So therefore... They're better? We can identify with them. Well, we're related, so we got to, they're our tribe, right? Okay. Is there any other, anything else, any, anything that, that, that might distinguish Adam and Eve in this transgression and Satan? Yeah. We see ourselves. So, all right, so we can relate, we see ourselves. Anything else? Yes, How if we're innocent, can we possibly be tempted? As long as innocent, All right, so the assertion is that if you're innocent, you can't be tempted. Well, that, you know, I, I would have a hard time convincing my, uh, my wife that my seven-year-old daughter is not constantly tempting my five-year-old, both of whom are pretty innocent, but uh, they're pretty mischievous of, uh, as well. Well, they're not innocent. How can an innocent person possibly begin to understand? All right, by innocent, you mean not... not uh, uh, of sound mind or not having reached a maturity of thinking? No temptation if you know the guilt. Well, guilt might follow, but that's an interesting assertion uh, about uh, the, the ability to be tempted if you're innocent. Uh, they, they, knew, they knew that they weren't supposed to have, you know, partake from that one tree, so they had knowledge of what the, 
what the, the boundaries of what was permissible, they knew, they knew those boundaries. And so, you know, they were given a choice to either follow the instruction of God or to follow the suggestion of, of Satan. So you could say, well, the nature of their crime was, you know, they were tempted by someone else. They were the victims. It wasn't really their fault. Those poor, you know, poor uh, individuals, you know, it was really bad Satan who did it all. No, because they had free will, they could choose to disobey. So they had free will. They could choose to disobey. So that's why they, they were, you know, it was a, they were set up. No. Uh, so... <laughs> Well, in a sense, because, you know, God did say at the very first verse, he's going to create for earth one who shall inherit it. So it was God's plan all along that they're going to be out of the garden and, and uh, you know, inheriting the earth. Yes? And you saw that they were dancing around in the nude. Well, but they didn't even notice their nakedness until afterwards. If you notice, also in the, in the second narrative in the Quran, after they ate from the tree, they felt ashamed and guilt. And then they noticed that they were naked and then they went to cover themselves. So they didn't even have a sense of what, what that was until afterwards. I'll just say, for time's sake, I'm going to move on quickly and just suggest that the next verse is kind of a giveaway, and for those who are reading ahead might have already sort of anticipated. So after being kicked out of the garden, Adam and Eve, in the second narrative, it explicitly says Adam and Eve both repented, and God forgave them both. And this is an important point of differentiation in the narrative, theological narrative, of the story of creation in, in uh, the Islamic tradition versus both Judaism and Christianity because in this narrative, we have a smaller story arc, if you will, whereas original sin, we would agree, but then there's also original repentance and original grace. And this is the story arc where God is loving and forgiving and merciful. And so when they uh, repented, God is most forgiving and he forgave them directly uh, without there being uh, a role for a... Um, uh, for, for uh, a sacrifice or a necessity of a sacrifice. It was simply the remorse, the repentance, etc. So that's a point of distinction. All right. For although we did say down with you all from this state, there shall, no, there shall nonetheless most certainly come unto you guidance from me. And those who follow my guidance need have no fear, nor shall they grieve. But those who are bent on denying the truth and giving the lie to our messages... They are destined to the fire, and therein they shall abide. So I would suggest that, theologically speaking, Islam is in between Judaism and Christianity. And here's what I mean by that. Islam is monotheistic uh, in terms of the understanding of God and the Godhead, like Judaism. One God, the Creator, you know, etc. Uh, but is closer to Christianity than Judaism in that we recognize that Jesus is Christ, born to the Virgin Mary, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and is the Word of God. All of those terms that I just said are in the Quran and referring only to Jesus. Muhammad is not the Christ, is not the Messiah. He's not divine. So, so I was very precise in the words that I used. Muslims would not, however, consider Jesus as part of the Godhead or part of, uh, you know, or, or part of the divine. What exactly is the Holy Spirit? Well, Muslims wouldn't say that that's also part of the, of the Godhead. Uh, so the issue of Trinity is something I'm sure all of you can explain to me in great detail, but uh, uh, I won't be asking you, uh, but, uh, so you can take a sigh of relief. But uh, in Islam, it's very clear, you know, uh, God, not that we can understand God, is, is uh, separate from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus, although Jesus was miraculously born to the Virgin Mary, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is the Word of God, and is Christ, and you know, slash the Messiah. So you have the concept. What's that? So with the question of Son of God, the terminology can get, you know, it's important to be very precise. So there is a tradition in, uh, in which the prophet Muhammad said that we are of the family of God. All of us are of the family of God. Uh, the term son of God in Christianity does not mean that God fathered a child and he is Jesus. That would not be where you would go with that, if I'm understanding correctly. So what exactly do you mean son? Spiritually, uh, you know, if he's not part of the Godhead uh, and God didn't father him, we would say that, you know, and the Quran says that God uttered a word and, and Jesus was. 
So he is the manifestation of the word of God. And that he was created by God through that act, through that word, and he became flesh, etc. But, but we wouldn't direct worship to God through Jesus, or we wouldn't worship Jesus directly. All of our worship is directed to God alone. And we turn to Jesus as an example, as an inspiration, as a, uh, as a, a prophet, as a messenger, as, uh, as uh, someone that we try and emulate so we consider ourselves followers of Jesus, but not uh, what we do not worship or direct our worship to or to Jesus or through Jesus. Yes. Yeah. So you have the. It sounds like you have the Trinity, but you don't have all the debate of the summer of 335 or whatever in the Council of Nicaea. So, so we we wouldn't say we have the Trinity in the sense that God is of a Trinity. We we believe in all three terms of the Trinity, but only one of them is divine. The other two are. Are not so God is divine, you know, God the Father, if you will. Uh, but Muslims also we don't anthropomorphize God, so God is not gendered in the same way. We do not depict. So what they came out of Nicaea. Yeah, yeah, in many, in many ways. So, so, so then the Orthodox are even a little bit different because they will not say that the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was inspired from God and Jesus. It says the Holy Spirit only comes from, from God, God, not from Jesus. So, 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 so my, my mom's, mom's Christian, Christian, and growing up. I had a foot in both tradition, and this is the kind of stuff that I, I actually found very interesting. And I looked at the history and the different debates. You had the monophysites, you had the diaphysites. You have all these debates in early Christianity, and it was when Constantine sort of had his, you know, his moment and locked everyone in the, in the Council of Nicaea and said, figure it out. Uh, you know, that's when you have that, that crystallization of that doctrine. Uh, and, but... You know, for me, who's not, you know, who has a foot in but also a foot out, it gave me a, an opportunity to say, well, what is, what is, what is the, the scripture actually say? There's the word Trinity isn't even mentioned in the Bible. I'm not challenging your theology, but I'm just sharing with you my process that I went through and said, you know, I don't see a huge dividing line between uh, the Islamic concept of God. It's not a necessary conflict between an Islamic understanding of God and the teachings of the Bible. And so, and Christians throughout history, some of the, some Christians throughout history have interpreted scripture, uh, either current denominations or, or extinguished or extinct denominations have interpreted and understood God in ways that are very similar to the way Muslims understand God as well. But that's a whole nother discussion that we, that we could spend a lot of time on that we're going to pass up now because you really want to know why we want to kill you. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, so, so the idea is also that there is a heaven and hell. There's a little bit of carrot stick here. I don't know if you noticed that. So anyone who, but also what's, what's fascinating here is in this verse, it's kind of an open idea. God will send to human beings who live on earth for, you know, who we have a limited time here on earth. God will send guidance. And that guidance will come in the form of personal inspiration, intuitive knowledge of, of good and bad and of God. Uh, through scripture, through the examples of, of prophets and, and saints. So this will come to people. Whoever is following the guidance and wisdom of God has nothing to fear for their soul. In other words, salvation is accessible to anyone on the earth, on the planet, who is, uh, uh, is submitting to that or following that guidance. So that's why this verse here is not an insignificant statement. So most certainly, there shall, nonetheless, most certainly come unto you, all humanity, all people, guidance from me. And here it's the intimate, not from us, but from me. And those who follow my guidance need have no fear for their soul, neither shall they grieve. So in other words, salvation is attainable. However, the stick part, those who are bent on denying the truth and giving the lie to our messages, they are destined for the fire therein they shall abide. So Muslims believe in a day of judgment, heaven and hell, However, hellfire is not necessarily an eternal damnation for anyone who shall enter it. Uh, the, the teachings, according to the teachings of Muhammad, um, he says that, or he reports that, anyone who has even a mustard seed, a very tiny amount of faith and goodness in their heart, shall eventually be purged from hellfire and make their way into, into heaven. So um, it's a slightly different notion of heaven. And yes, for those who read Dante's Inferno, I think he was influenced somewhat by Islamic uh, uh, theology and descriptions of heaven and hell and the levels of heaven and hell. Although he puts Muhammad, I think, in the sixth circle of hell. 
which is not the Islamic narrative, but uh, nonetheless, there, there are levels of heaven, levels of hell, and it's that, the idea is that we're here for a limited period of time on earth. For what purpose? To try and become better people. And if, and if we face the hardships of life and we respond to those challenges, to those hardships, to the temptations, it, we're going to fall short, but if we do and we repent or if we overcome them the first time we grow and become better people, then it's not that we can earn paradise, but that we might be more worthy of God's grace and mercy on that day of judgment. And it's, that's open to anybody and everybody, and we don't say as Muslims, unless you're Muslim, you're out, um, or if you're Muslim, you're guaranteed paradise. That's not part of the Islamic narrative. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll share with you some verses uh, more specifically about that. So here also we believe in Satan, but that Satan has no power over anyone other than to tempt. And again, this could be literal or metaphoric, allegorical, however you want to read it. But, and Satan will say when the matter is decided, which is what, which is when? Judgment. Day of judgment, which is when? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we don't know either, right? Uh, it was God who gave you a promise of truth. I too promised, but I failed in my promise to you. You know, those, you know Satan lied. I had no authority over you except to tempt you, except to call you. But you listen to me. So don't blame me. Reproach me not, but reproach your own souls. I can't listen to your cries on this day, the day of judgment, nor can you listen to mine because he's also going to face his own. He's not in charge of hell. Satan was a bad actor, and he's going to have to face his own consequence according to Islamic theology. Um, I reject your associating me as God or worshiping me or following me instead of God. Uh, for wrongdoers, there must be a grievous penalty. So that's number one. So we have temptations of Satan, but we can't claim an excuse, neither can Adam and Eve, well, he made me do it. No, he had no authority other than the tempt. That's number one. Also, there's challenges of life. Uh, and God says, and we shall try you until we have test those among you who strive to their utmost and persevere in patience, and we shall try your reported metal. Or be sure we shall test you with something of fear and hunger and some loss of goods or lives, or the fruits of your toil, but give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere, who say when afflicted with calamity, to God we belong and to him is our return. They are those on whom descend blessings from God and mercy, and they are the ones that receive guidance. So this is kind of our human predicament. Uh, one more um, notion is that we also have this intuitive knowledge of God, according to chapter 7, verse 172, when God says, When your Lord drew forth from the children of Adam from their loins their descendants and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, Am I not your Lord who cherishes and sustains you? And all of us said, Yay, we do. Do you guys remember being drawn forth from the loins of the... You guys don't remember that? That was a trip. No. Uh, what's implied here is that this is, an, this, is this primordial contract with God is, a, a, is a, a way to suggest that the notion of God is something that resonates in the hearts uh, and in the souls of humans. It's something that fits with our DNA. It's part of our constitution. It's in our innate nature, this notion of God. And that's why uh, I'm going to be filming on Monday uh, a series with Morgan Freeman on God. He's doing a documentary on God with the Na National Geographic Channel. And you'll find that he travels around the world and looks at the various cultures that deal with, you know, that, that, that look at different ways humans have attempted to, to connect to God. Uh, but it's a, something, it's a universal uh, historical phenomenon uh, throughout our history as human beings. And so uh, a Muslim theologian would say, yes, that's because the idea or notion of God is a natural, uh, a natural one. And then uh, lastly, we also have a, a, mor a moral compass an innate knowledge of good and bad. So God says in chapter 91, by the soul and the proportion and order given to it, and its enlightenment as to its wrong and its right, truly he succeeds that purifies it, and he fails that corrupts it. So God's swearing by the human soul, and it, how he inspired in the soul the essential knowledge in general terms of what's right and wrong. You know it. You know it. At the core of your being, generally what's right and what's wrong. And our goal is to purify our soul and to be in tune with what, what that knowledge of good and bad is. All right, so our predicament then is we have free will. Uh, we have intelligence. We have intuitive knowledge of God and intuitive knowledge of good and bad. We also have the example of prophets and, and all of that. 
And our goal, as I stated earlier, is to try and uh, learn our lessons in life so that when we, when we pass and stand before God, uh, God might be more, um, it, we might be more deserving of God's grace. Uh, really quick anecdote on this regard. There is a, there is a notion uh, in Islam that you can't earn paradise. There is a, um, a parable that Muhammad taught in which a man comes before God on the day of judgment with a mountain of good deeds, metaphorically speaking. And, and God says, by my grace, you may enter my paradise. And the man says, well, hold on. I want to go in based on my good deeds. Look how many I have. And so God, God says, all right. He places his good deeds on one side of the scale. On the other side, he doesn't put his bad deeds. He puts the blessing of eyesight. And all of his de- good deeds didn't compensate or, 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 or uh, amount to enough gratitude just for that one blessing, let alone all the other countless blessings, let alone to offset his bad deeds. So the man, seeing that with his blessed eyesight, said, okay, okay, I'll go in based on your grace. And so God then <laughs> enters him into paradise. Um, or, or this other uh, parable in which, uh, um, you know, there's a notion that God can forgive any transgressions we, give, we, do, we, make, we perform against God. But if we transgress against another human being, we have to ask that person's forgiveness. And, uh, and, and, and so there's a, uh, a man who comes before God on the day of judgment, and the person who was wronged by someone else. And he says... God, this person wronged me. I want him to be held to account. So God takes this person making that claim and shows, takes him and shows him paradise and says, with what will you purchase that? And the man is speechless. He brings the other man uh, who, who had wronged him. He said, forgive your brother. Take him by the hand and both of you together enter my paradise. So there's this notion that you know, and there's a teaching Muhammad says, be merciful to others in this life in hopes that God will be merciful to you in the hereafter. We always want justice now, but no one, none of us want justice on the day of judgment. We always want mercy. And so God says, show mercy, show mercy so that you may be shown mercy. All right. Uh, with regards to interfaith relations, the scripture, the Quran, so Muhammad lived almost 600 years after Jesus. He's a descendant of Abraham, a cousin of Jesus, if you will, because Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and Isaac's descendants became, so Isaac's the younger brother. Ishmael's the older brother from Hagar, right? So Ishmael's descendants became the Arabs. Isaac's descendant was Jacob. Jacob's nickname was Israel. Israel had the 12 tribes, and then you have history, Moses, and then later Jesus. So, uh, so, Jews and Christians are cousins to Muslims, or Arabs at least, and you know, many of whom became Muslim. So, so we're all in the same family here. So everything that's going on in the world is just really a big family squabble. No. Uh, so, so, uh, so Muhammad was born uh, 500 years after Jesus, and, and uh, he taught, uh, a, a, uh, he, Muslims believe he received a revelation of the scripture known as the Quran, and that these verses that I've been sharing with you come from that scripture. So these are Quranic scriptures, uh, verses from the Quran. So in the Quran, this scripture, this holy text, what Muslims believe came as a direct revelation from God, is surprisingly open. And this verse is a repeated verse. It's not the only time it occurs in the Quran. To each is a goal to which God has turned him. Then strive together as in a race towards all that is good. Wherever so you are, God will bring you together, for God has power over all things. Implied in this is that, first of all, it was God who chose that there be diversity. It's God's will that there be diversity. God has, chosen, has turned you in different ways. But despite those differences of theology and whatnot, what is our mandate as human beings? It's to encourage one another. Race with one another, not to defeat one another, but to encourage one another in doing what's, what's, what's in the common good, what's virtuous. So we are to collaborate and cooperate across the, the differences, either intra or interfaith, and acknowledge that most of what we stand for, the values are shared, so let us cooperate on, on what is good. There's another verse that says, ta'awunu ala al-birri wa taqwa, cooperate 
upon things that are righteous and, uh, and, and, and uh, are, uh, that have God at the center of them. All right. To reinforce this is another verse in chapter 5, verse 48. To thee, O Muhammad, we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it. All right, the, 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 the Torah, the, the Gospels, or as I said when I was uh, learning about religion on five, my mom said that I said uh, the, 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 the Torah and the gossip. Um, <laughs> uh, confirming the scripture that came before it and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what God has revealed and follow not their vain desires, their verging from the truth that has come to thee. All right, here's the part that I wanted to focus on. To each among you, we have prescribed a law and an open way. In other words, that there are different approaches to God. If God had so willed, he could have made you a single people. But his plan is to test you in what he has given you. So strive as if in a race in all virtues. The goal of you all is to God. It is he that will show you the truth of the matters in which you dispute. So in other words, and I don't know how many of you, how many angels are on the head of the pin, all right? When we will know on that day, but in the meantime, let's figure out how we can cooperate for the common good. So he'll, he'll inform us about those differences and the nuances and the, and the, the, the idiosyncrasies, but the, 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 the message is clear here. We should cooperate for the common good, and God will ultimately be the judge. All right. So um, I wanted to stop now. It's 744, and we wanted to have maybe uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour for question and answers, whatever, whatever you want. I just wanted to show you really, really, really quickly um, that uh, you know, there's more uh, that I have here in case you don't have any questions that uh, include uh, 1,400 years of Islamic history. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and so it's a pretty awesome presentation. Yeah, these are Arabic numerals that we use. That many angles per each symbol. No, no, they're, well, they're slightly off, but each symbol has that many uh, acute angles. So uh, the Arabs came up with the, with the numbers that we use now before we're using Roman numerals. So they're called numerals now, but Arabic numerals, right? Uh, algebra is an Arabic word. Algorithm comes from al-Khawarizm, uh, which, which is the guy who came up with the, um, with the idea. Um, this guy, 600 years before Galileo, calculated the circumference of the earth. Um, so as Muslims did science and poetry, uh, Rumi, architecture. This is in the Grand Mosque of Cordoba. This is in Bukhara. This is in Timbuktu. Uh, and this is a pagoda-style mosque in, in, Spain, in uh, China. All right, so, um, so that was Islamic history in uh, 30 seconds. But uh, I, wa I wanted to get to the, question at, the you know, questions that are on your mind. And the first one is probably uh, uh, what you said sounds great, so why is there so much bloodshed in the world? And as a historian uh, and as an academic, I actually dedicated a lot of my graduate uh, research into this question just... Uh, for personal interest, because of personal interest. Uh, Bernard Lewis wrote a book uh, about Islam in which he describes Islam as having bloody borders, and the name of the book is What Went Wrong with Islam. Uh, and there are a number of books that, that, that explore this question at some length. Um, but what I ultimately found was the answer. Let me have a drip of, drink of water, just for a dramatic effect. Oh, it fell down? All right. What I ultimately found was the answer... <clears throat> was that uh, despite being a person of religion, someone who aspires that religion informs my, my, my conduct and uh, helps me become a better person, um, religion is usually not the main motivating factor in people's behavior, except for all of you, uh, and, uh, and that people are motivated by uh, other kinds of you know, Freudian things like power and you know, greed, uh, money, sex, other things, tribalism. Uh, I don't know if that was one of Freudian, you know, the Freud, Freud's, uh, uh, part of Freud's theory, but you know, we have this, these tendencies as human beings to be motivated by these other factors. And um, 
and so I was, uh, I was recently on, a, on, a, on an NPR program with the Congressman Adam Schiff, who heads up the uh, Intelligence Committee and uh, the head of RAND Corporation's uh, counterterrorism uh, unit, which he's run since 1971, the year I was born, uh, Brian Jenkins. And we were discussing ISIS and whatnot, and I made the assertion that ISIS, uh, which invokes Islam as, as a justification, as an inspiration to try and either get support internally or get, garner support externally, really is not Islamic in any way, shape, or form, nor are they motivated by Islam. What they are is motivated by their identity as, as a group of Arab uh, tribes that are Sunni in their orientation as part of their identity, uh, but that they're really after geopolitical power, money, oil, etc., and that religion is something that's invoked, but really not what's motivating them. Both congressmen, uh, Schiff and Brian Jenkins agreed with me fully and they, and they said that it's not about religion. It has everything to do with these other factors. Uh, and, and the analogy that, that, uh, that I use uh, and, and that helped me come to my uh, understanding of all of this was looking at similar conflicts that used terrorism and other terrible techniques to, uh, for, as, a, as a means to their, to their objective um, in which religion was invoked. Um, so, for example, I studied the, the, the case of Northern Ireland. Now, in that scenario, you have a post-colonial you know, state of, of Northern Ireland whose population is split between Catholics and Protestants. Now, um, I guess the mother church, the Anglican church, right, the Protestant church of England, uh, is, the, um, uh, you know, is aligned with the, Angl the, 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 the Protestants in Northern Ireland. And then the Catholics were struggling for control of the state and for authority, et cetera, et cetera, and would employ, the IRA would employ terrorism as a technique in order to gain uh, a power in, in that region. Now, there's nothing inherently in Catholicism that, or, or even remotely within Catholicism, that justifies that kind of, uh, of, of behavior let alone you know, the Crusades and all of the other stuff that's more distant in the past. But I'm talking about in the modern, uh, in the modern world of nation states, that you had two identity groups that had different notions of what it meant to be Northern Irish, and religion was the dividing line. And they would invoke their identity as Catholic or as Protestant in their mistreatment of one another, and the, the Protestants did some mistreatment along the way as well, some brutality and you know, some, some other things that were worse. Uh, but it had nothing to do with, with that, and it had nothing to do with Catholicism. It had everything to do with these modern, you know, it's modern national identity politics. We see it rearing its head now here in the United States, and, you know, different, uh, poli uh, different, different identity groups. Fortunately, we're not devolving into violence uh, and mayhem. But you look at other places where there is similar... Uh, struggle within a nation state, the borders of a nation state, two groups that would employ terrorism in order to achieve their uh, political objectives. So this one, you know, Foucault, who's a, a, um, a, a continental scholar uh, on uh, power and, and politics and, and, and uh, history, he suggests that modern national identity has five main characteristics, five main, main aspects of what goes into a modern national identity. Religion is one part, but you also have language, history, culture, and attachment to a particular piece of land. And where you have competing national narratives, national identities over the same piece of land, is when you have conflict. So if you look at the Basques, for example, in, in north, northern Spain, the Basques are Basque. They speak Basque. They, you know, they have that history. They have their own attachment to the Pyrenees, and they wanted to break off from Spain. Where they didn't differ from the rest of Spain is that they're all Catholic. But yet they employed terrorism, they bombed civilian targets, they did all kinds of terrible things in order to try and atrophy the Spanish military and try and turn public opinion against the, 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 the Spanish government who was insisting on maintaining that as part of the integrity of the Spanish state. I'm getting into all of this for a very important reason and outside of the Muslim world because there's not an exceptionalist lens through which we should look at the Muslim world. It all fits within the same pattern. And if you look at Iraq, for example, 
you have the three countries, uh, or the three competing groups, main, main competing groups of, of the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds. What's their religion? Muslim what? Sunni or Shiite? You don't know, because it doesn't fit into the media narrative, right? But what's going on? Well, they're Sunni. They're the same religious denomination as the Arabs. And who are they fighting? They're fighting the, you know, the, the, the Sunni Arabs. So here it's Sunni versus Sunni. It has nothing to do with religion. But what's going on? Why are they fighting? Well, they have the piece of land, Kurdistan, right in the north. They have oil. They have other things. They speak Kurdish. They're culturally Kurdish. They have the history, everything. So why are they fighting against the Arabs? Well, because the Arabs have their own national identity. They have their own language. So it's just like the Basques. Religion is not the dividing line there. It's this, uh, the, all other four aspects of culture and national narrative that splits them. And in the case of, of the Shiites, they're all Arab, but it's only religion that's dividing the Sunnis and the Shiites. And so my point is, and I see your question in the back. I'll get to you in just one second. My point is simply this, that when the Ottoman Empire, which was multilinguistic, multiethnic, multiracial, everything, uh, uh, multi-religious, when they transitioned into the modern world in World War II and became a modern nation state, they got rid of all of their, or they had taken away all of their other nationalities, and they were just the Turks that were remaining, right? No. Who was left? The Armenians and the Kurds. And so here, Sunni Kurds and Sunni Turks, what happened to the Kurds? Just like in Iraq, they were marginalized, it became illegal to speak Turkish, to name your child a, Turk, a Kurdish name, or to speak Kurdish, rather, to name your child a Kurdish name, uh, to have a Kurdish flag, to do anything, because that was, they were trying to consolidate um, Turkey, and Ataturk came up with a phrase that say, I'm proud that everyone had to say every morning as part of the national anthem, they had to say uh, before going to school, as part of the, the formal you know, uh, doc indoctrination, is they had to say every morning, even if you're Kurdish, I am proud to be a Turk. All right? Nemutlu Turkum Diana was the expression. So, so, uh, and then the Armenians. So there was this, you know, that, and that was, you know, you know, on the run up to World War I, but it was as Turkey was becoming this monolithic national state. Now, even taking it a little bit before, because a lot of European countries had become already nation, nation states before, but you take some place like Italy. Italy is a place that speaks Italian. Well, you know, there are different regions, and they all have great, like, Sicilian and, and you know, different regions. Only 2% of what is now the city, the, 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 the state of, of, of Italy, the country of Italy, spoke what is the national language of Italian. They spoke other dialects. But once the nation state came, they imposed it, and they made it uniform. And that's what nation states do. So when you have a state that's divided, and you have competing either language groups or whatever who don't go along with the program, then they, they form a subversive this or that. Afghanistan is a bunch of different tribes. They have different ethnicities. They're kind of put together by the British or by the Sykes and Pico or by you know, different colonial powers. You know, and they don't always get along. And then when, when the imposition... Uh, uh, of the colonial powers dissipates, or the, the force of the colonial powers dissipates, then you find other tensions that arise in competition. Again, outside of the Muslim world, Rwanda. All right, you had the, the Hutus, which were 89% of the population, and the Tutsis, which were 11%. Now, the Tutsis were 11% were favored by the, by the Belgians, uh, and they were, they were given better education, and they kind of had a dominance in this country, even though they're a minority. Well, the majority took exception to that, and you know, there was a genocide, a million people killed as a result. Had nothing to do with religion per se, it was more tribalism. But my point is simple, simply that this barbaric, kind of violent, et cetera, is a symptom of modern nationalism uh, and competing nationalities or national narratives within city-states or within, uh, I'm sorry, countries uh, whose uh, populations are competing for that authority and the power of the state. So this is a major thesis that I found for myself that I, I wanted to share with you. You can challenge it, but this is really what I've come to, come to conclude with regards to what's going on in the Muslim world. And that it has nothing to do with Islam because if you look at Islamic history, Islam spread to Christian lands immediately after the, the death of Muhammad. 
Egypt and the Levant, Syria, greater Syria, were majority Christian countries. And after Islam spread there, they remained majority Christian countries for over 400 years. And up until recently, the populations in those countries were 10 to 15 percent Christians. Uh, Christian. Uh, I, I was very honored to um, um, receive the first time ever Saint uh, the Saint Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai. Uh, they, they brought their icons out, and they survived the iconoclastic period of early Christianity. Uh, they, were, they, they received protection of the Muslim uh, you know, conquerors of that area, as did the churches. Omar, who was the conqueror, actually wrote a pact. And you can see it if you go to, Jer to, Jer to Jerusalem. Next to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's Omar's Mosque. And there you have the pact in which uh, it's translated and written in, in granite on the wall. Uh, in which Omar says, your churches are protected, your, your, your property is protected, you can worship as you please, etc., etc., etc. So these were, um, you know, principles that are, in, that are consistent with the Quranic teaching about uh, being uh, tolerant and inclusive and, and etc., and even, you know, uh, opening up the possibility of, 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 um, uh, of, of there being salvation for more than just the Muslim community, uh, and this kind of cooperation, I mean, Maimonides, who was a very famous Jewish rabbi, considered the era under, under uh, Muslim rule as the golden age of Judaism. He was the, the physician to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the sultan at the time. And uh, he, uh, uh, you know, Jews worshipped openly and freely, etc., even while they were facing persecution in Europe. So my point is simply what you see now is not inevitable, it's not an, an essential part of Islam, but it has more to do with the Muslim world that used to be part of this civilization that was multi-everything, now being brought into the world of nation states and in the, uh, the post-colonial era, having a difficult time adjusting to modernity. And geopolitics comes into play, the Cold War had a factor, our foreign policy had a factor with supporting this or that kind of regime. Uh, you know, Iran is still reeling from uh, or overthrowing their democratic uh, president in 1953, uh, Mossadegh. So, you know, there's, there's still a, a legacy and a challenge, and it has everything to do with modern geopolitics and oil and economy and, you know, other things than it has to do with religion. So uh, that's, my, that's my thesis, and yes, you've been very patient in the back. My question is, um, to what extent is Sharia part of Islam? How important is... So, what is Sharia as you understand it? I understand it to be a theocracy. But... No, Sharia is not a theocracy. I mean, I understand Sharia is to be part of the theocracy. In other words, the Ayatollahs impose Sharia law in their countries. Okay, so Iran is a theocracy, but what is Sharia? Is it, I thought it was a law system. It's a legal, yeah, a legal principles. Right. So, uh, I would say that Islamic law, Sharia, uh, which I taught at a law school for many years, so. Uh, Islamic law is God's law, like be just, be honest, be, you know, all of these things, do not kill, you know, some of them are specific, but most of them are principles. Uh, that is an essential part of Islamic, uh, the Islamic faith. Now, uh, what exactly is God's law, in sp specifically, no one really knows, but the people, the people try and apply verses of the Quran or interpret verses of the Quran, and they, you know, it goes through the human agency or human filter. And then what you have is scholars or doctors of law, jurists, who try and interpret what Islamic law would mean for any given place and time, uh, given their knowledge of the land, given the knowledge of society, given knowledge of scripture, etc. They would formulate, uh, you know, specific uh, legal responsa to circumstances that arise. Now, I, I go into this kind of complicated, messy explanation of what Islamic law is, because it's what we're really talking about is jurisprudence or fiqh, uh, F-I-Q-H, just in case you thought I was cursing, um, and uh, and and that refers to this uh, you know human product that is you know, up, upon which there are you know as many opinions as there are jurists, and so if a state sort of a, wants to implement the Sharia, what they're really implementing is not the Sharia because that's kind of unknowable in its details. What they're really adopting is a human interpretation of the Sharia according to a school of law, a school of thought, an individual, a legislature. So it, actually you could find a scenario in which Islamic law in a Muslim-majority country 
has, its, uh, has voting, has a legislature, has a constitution, and their understanding of law is filtered through that human agency and through that elected governance. In other words, democracy is not incompatible with Islam. That Iran chose to, you know, after the revolution, revolution go with a the the theocratic state is a particular choice of Iran, but it's not an inevitable um, you know, direction that Islam would go. In Saudi Arabia, there's a kingdom. It's also it's a theocracy in a sense, because the king decides what Islamic law is or which interpretation to implement, and it's really up to the whim of the king. But um, you know, they're, they're, Islamic law as, a, as, a, as an understanding primarily deals with, and you might be surprised, dietary law, like what's halal, thank you very much for the wonderful meal, uh, you know, how to wash for prayer, when to pray, you know, how to, how to bury, you know, someone who passes and to clean them beforehand, all of these kinds of things. And so uh, my, my point in mentioning that Islam, Sharia and Islamic law is central to Islam, it's not necessarily what you're imagining, stoning someone and you know, chopping off the hands. In fact, stoning is not mentioned in the Quran. It's mentioned in a different scripture known as the Bible. And, and so it's not in the Quran at all. There is no verse on stoning in the Quran. It's only mentioned in the Bible. So that Muslim stone today is, you know, has its own sort of narrative and history and, and, and reasons. But it's not because it's in the scripture. And it has to do with that interpretive process and et cetera that human beings engaged in who you know, were considered authoritative. But there's no hierarchy either. And so how a particular state in the current contemporary age might choose to implement an Islamic law is a very messy prospect because Shiites are only 15% of the population. 85% of the Muslim world is, is Sunni. And without a hierarchy, without a pope, without any kind of you know, fast and, and, and hard doctrinal and legal interpreter, individual or, or, or body, every state oftentimes has its own policies and sometimes uh, are, are directly involved in determining those things and other times are very laissez-faire with regards to you know, those issues and, and they tend to be more secular, like Turkey is a more secular state, uh, although it's a 98% you know, Muslim, uh, it's a secular state. Uh, and so, you know, every state is different. Every state is different, and so you can't make a, an overall generalization. Even the secular state in Turkey, you ask anybody there, what do you think of Sharia? They say, oh, Sharia is core to my belief. Do they implement Sharia? Well, they eat kosher food or halal food. They'll, you know, they'll pray and wash, and those are the majority of the things. You're thinking of criminal punishment. Well, crime and punishment is something that is not an individual vigilante kind of thing. The state does that, and so they defer to the state, and the state has its own processes by which they formulate their laws, and they might or might not follow the black letter you know, rule of law depending on this or that text, or they might have a more nuanced and engaged process that might involve a parliament and a democracy to, write, to arrive at those legislative issues of governance. So it's, it's not as, you know, the image is, Stoning and chopping hands and burqas and all of that, but that's not what Sharia is. Sharia is a very complicated system of principles and methodology by which you interpret those principles to apply in the modern context. Yes? So I, I think most of us have identified with all that you have presented. And, and this group is maybe unusual in that we are so tolerant of, of, of different religions. And yet, I wonder, if you look forward, when is it going to get better in, and what do you see as, as the future? Tell us what the future looks like. All right. We know what the present looks yes. like. We know what... You, we know God is the guiding hand. All right. So tell us what the future So I actually know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Okay. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Eventually, we're all going to perish, and we're going to be standing before God in judgment, and God is good. So that's not a bad thing. But before that point, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. You think I think so. I, and the reason why I think so is, you know, as a good friend of mine once said, Follow the money, all right? And the money in, the, in today's world still, unfortunately, is oil. And oil is such a corrupting force in the region because it's, 
you know, it, it, it uh, empowers greedy individuals uh, with a tremendous amount of brute force that they can use not only over their own population but against neighboring populations. And when you have major powers like Saudi Arabia and Iran duking it out for control and influence of not only oil but the region, um, it's, you know, and, and Saudi Arabia is becoming more desperate. I, I, you know, they're not democratic, stable regimes, et cetera. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And, and that's my, you know, I, that's, that's unfortunate. But it, that's, I, you know, that's the way I see it. If, if, if there were lots and lots of guns, and there were, at $145 a barrel, $135 a barrel oil, and now we have oil in the 20s, it seems proportionally, or, or somewhere there's got to be a metric or ratio, there are fewer guns, but you don't see it that way? That's correct. I don't see it that way for a couple of reasons. Number one, first of all, Iran just had a windfall because they had a lot of their assets unfrozen, so they have access to, you know, right. I think uh, over $100 billion now. Plus, they're, they're ramping up their production. They're not slowing it down. I don't know if you follow what OPEC and whatnot, but they're giving pushback to even the freeze because they want to be up to the pre-2012 uh, embargo levels uh, of over uh, 400 million, uh, 4 million uh, barrels a day. So, so they're going to ramp up their production. Plus, they already, you know, they're unlocking a lot. And they're tapping into their allies in the area because, you know, in Yemen, in Iraq now, which is 60% Shiite, and they're they're supporting now with the help of Russia, uh, places in you know Syria, the Syrian regime, which is a, a it's just the, it's the human travesty of our era. Uh, it's just such a, a heartrending scenario. What's going? What's taking place there? And it's a stalemate because you have all of these um, forces that are creating this equilibrium of misery in that region, in which. Um, women and children get the worst of it. Uh, and and uh, it, it's just so, it, the destruction of human life and, and civilization is just so uh, immense there. But you have all of these forces now with, with Russia, the US, uh, Israel, uh, also uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran, all playing a role in that area. And there's, it's not just the people of Syria want a revolution and want, to, to vote and to want democracy, but now you have all these other factors, and so it's gonna, it's you know, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. I, I'm sorry to say, and, and that you know, the temporary flux. I mean, oil is gonna go back up at some point. I know that we have, uh, it's gonna go back up again, and even if it doesn't, you know, you, what you're gonna have is the same amount of money being spent on militarization, and you're gonna have people that are that are gonna be less well off, and now they're gonna be angry, and they're gonna be even more volatile. So it's not that, oh, we have less money, let's spend less on weaponry. No, it's let's spend less on, on, uh, uh, on supplementing the health, the, the health and welfare of our own population. Yes? Um, what do I say to my friends who say, where is the Muslim leadership when we have 9-11 uh, and various other act, acts like that? Why don't they speak up more? That's an excellent question. This is probably the most often asked question that I've, that I've received in, in all my years of, of speaking publicly about Islam. The question, for those who didn't hear, is where, you know, how do you answer a friend that says, where are the Muslim leaders condemning terrorism and speaking out? Where is the leadership? So my answer to you is, who are the top 50 Muslim leaders in the world that you're waiting to hear from? <coughs> Who's the top one Muslim leader you're waiting to hear from? All right, what if I told you that the top 20,000 Muslim leaders around the world have all gone on record condemning terrorism, not just on 9-11, but on every occasion since? Yeah. We haven't heard them, so it must not have happened, right? Well, two weeks ago, or, or three weeks ago, an organization in, uh, that represents you know, 180 million Muslims in Indonesia uh, made a public declaration. You heard of it? They made a public declaration and you know condemning terrorism. We issued a fatwa, which you might think means to cut someone's head off. No, we issued a fatwa, which is a legal opinion, a legal 
you know, according to Islamic law, right, Islamic legal shari opinion or a fiqhi opinion, condemning terror, this is in 2005, and we invited all the media to come to the mosque, and after a Friday sermon, we told, we're going to issue a fatwa, so everyone thought, whoa, let's show up, so we said, we're issuing, and we did this in cooperation with every uh, national and even regional and international Muslim uh, organization and, and religious body, condemning terrorism and, and mandating that every Muslim work closely with law enforcement to protect our country against another attack. How many of you have heard of this declaration, which has been, you have, excellent, which, which has been repeated. There was a 600-page fatwa that was issued. Uh, every major uh, Muslim country uh, has condemned uh, terrorism and the specific acts of 9-11 and Paris and San Bernardino, et cetera. Every single Muslim scholar of any influence has gone on record. Four weeks ago, four weeks ago in, in Morocco, the th top 300 Muslim scholars in the world gathered together in Morocco for a three-day conference at the conclusion of which they issued a declaration calling for the protection of Christian and Jewish minorities and uh, uh, sectarian minority groups within Muslim-majority countries. How many of you heard of that? All right. It, you know, it comes across my news feed because I'm looking for it, but it just doesn't get news. What does get news is when you have an angry-looking Muslim frothing at the mouth, saying he wants to kill someone. And that's why ISIS, which is really not a threat other than regionally, other than they might inspire some you know, nut job to go and do what they did in San Bernardino, for example, but it's not really a threat. I mean, there have been more people killed in the United States from gun violence, many more fold. I mean, last year alone, there were over 300 mass shootings in the United States. By mass shootings, four or more people were killed. 350 mass shootings in the United States. Uh, there was, you know, the, there were more attacks by uh, right-wing extremists in the United States. There were 48 since 9/11. There were, I think, three or four Muslim uh, 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 terrorist acts here in the United States since then. Uh, so it's not really as, you know, we have it looming large in our consciousness, but they're not really that you know, that, that powerful uh, of, a, of, a, of, an, of an organization or an institution outside of their own region, ISIS is in, in at least. Um, and uh, I was going to say something else related. Remind me what the, what the uh, last comment was that, that I said. I lost my train of thought. So the media coverage. So, yeah. so, so we, 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 for example, we, for example, um, would, ha would help, uh, I, I personally organized after 9-11 every year a memorial event at the Islamic Center, interfaith memorial event, in which we offered peace awards to Christian, Jewish, civic leaders who were working to build a, a, a better society and, and bridge the gap of understanding. We always invited the media, they never came. One year they came. One year they came in good numbers, local television. And, uh, and, and so they interviewed me for the for the program, and what are you doing here? I said, oh, we're gathering together for this purpose that I just told you about. And they said, okay, thank you. Do you know that later on this afternoon, and for, for those of you who might remember, there was a group called the Minutemen before the Tea Party. The Minutemen will be gathering in front of the mosque across town in Culver City. I live in, in L.A. Across the town in Culver City, and they're going to be burning an effigy of Osama bin Laden. This is like in 2006 or 2007, before before Osama bin Laden was, was, was captured or was killed. They're going to be burning a flag of Osama bin Laden in front of the mosque in Culver City. I said, yes, I'm aware. What do you think? I said, well, you know, we, you know, we, we choose instead of to, to protest and to, to do provocative things, to gather together and to try and listen and understand one another and, and find our common grounds and to work, work towards a better world. The, the, the reporter literally... She, she stepped up from, uh, aside from the camera, and she goes, oh, come on, you could say something more sexy than that. All right? Literally, that's a quote. She wanted me to be angry. She wanted me to, like, you know, she had the story frame in her mind. 
Minutemen angry here, Muslims angry here. You know, she, it was like I wasn't feeding into her narrative. So she's like, oh, come on. You could say something more provocative, more, you know, more, more emotional. She used the word sexy. She literally said that. So, you know, it's, it's just media doesn't cover religion well. And they don't cover peaceful things very well. If it bleeds, it leads. You know, and so, you know, the news is not going to be covering this event. Uh, it's, just not, it's just not the way news works. Pew did a study. They showed in that study that 70%, 69% of, of Americans admitted to knowing little to nothing about Islam. And not surprisingly, almost the same exact percentage, almost 70% of Americans admitted to having a negative idea or impression about Islam and Muslims. Politicians take advantage of the ignorance and the fear, and they see this is a wedge issue. And there have been studies done by uh, an organization in Michigan called ISPU that have correlated the incidence of anti-Muslim attacks and anti-Muslim hate speech and hate incidents not to uh, a, an act of terrorism that Muslims commit around the world. And by the way, most terrorist acts committed by Muslims are against other Muslims. So we're the biggest victims of that. Our, our condemning of terrorism is not a PR move. We're actually... The, the, and the crosshairs of these terrorists. So uh, the, the correlation of, this, of these hate incidents and these, these uh, hate crimes, and the real crimes. I'm not talking about people getting shot and killed and who drive taxis who, looks Mus who look Muslim-y. Uh, you know, they're, 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 it's, the correlation is not to the hate incidents, but to election cycles in which politicians go on record uh, uh, saying outrageous things against Islam and Muslims, empowering people who might otherwise, you know, keep their bigotry to themselves, they feel emboldened and empowered and they will go out and manifest it. I met with this gentleman in Texas. There, Catherine Bigelow, who did the Hurt Locker and some other things, she's going to do a movie on this. I met with this gentleman named Rais Bouyan. How many of you have ever heard of Rais Bouyan? Nobody. He was from Bangladesh in Texas, working at a convenience store, hoping to make his way through, pay his way through college and go on to become an engineer or something. And after 9-11, a, uh, a, a white supremacist, drug-addicted criminal wanted to take revenge about 9-11, so he went around to convenience stores in, in Texas, in Houston, shooting people who looked Muslim. He shot this guy in the face with a shotgun, very close proximity, and the guy fell and was bleeding, and the, he thought he was dead, and he left, and he went and he killed a couple of other people. Um, he was caught and put in prison. This guy, his life was ruined. He was, had a fiancé back in Bangladesh. He couldn't travel. It broke off. His medical bills went through the roof. His life was miserable. Five, six years later, He's in the doldrums. He's really kind of depressed. He decides to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. And there, on, while on pilgrimage, he says, you know what? I'm going to pull my life back together. I'm going to forgive the guy who did this to me. So he came back to the United States, and he went and he reached out to the, to the guy who is now on death row, and he... he um, uh, uh, you know, tried to, to, to uh, make, you know, to, to, to uh, reach out to him and let him know that he forgave him. But more importantly, what he began was a crusade to get the guy off of death row. And he worked tirelessly, writing letters and developed a whole campaign to get this guy off of death row. So not only did he personally forgive him, but he worked to, to, to save him from, from, the, the, from the death penalty. The guy transformed in prison and, and whatnot, and um, this was under George Bush uh, era, so the guy was actually put to death. Uh, the, the efforts didn't work. But a book was written called The True American, and what it, what it highlighted in this story was the two Americas. Here you have the, someone, an immigrant pursuing the American dream, and here you have someone who came from the dominant, hegemonic, you know, white uh, you know, uh, culture, but was raised by uh, an abusive, alcoholic father who mistreated him, had a miserable life, 
was uh, addicted to methamphetamines and to you know and was taken under under the wing of a right of a white supremacist group. So the guy had a miserable life and upbringing, and here was this American you know this immigrant pursuing the American dream, and their their paths cross at this very tra in this very tragic way. And so this movie is going to come and highlight this. My point in mentioning all of this is that you know it's great that a movie is going to come out and, and talk about this, but, but generally, media doesn't know how to talk about religion effectively, and the only, the, the only time I'm asked to, to do an interview is when there's a tragedy. I was on NPR like six times since, uh, since San Bernardino, uh, you know, and other local news media, et cetera. I was invited to the White House uh, to uh, last February uh, to uh, a summit on countering violent extremism. You know, I work with the LAPD closely on their counterterrorism unit. But most of our community, according to FBI statistics, are not just law-abiding, but are integrated seamlessly into American mainstream. Most, Ameri most American Muslims are uh, as educated, if not more, than your average American, and as well off as your average American, uh, if, not, if not more well off than your average American. So we are a success story of integration, not like Muslims in Europe, that's a whole different demographic. But that story is not out there. All you hear in the media is this, this conflict and terrorism and the voices of you know, conflict from abroad you don't hear from American Muslims. When, you, know, you don't think of, when you think of American Muslims, you don't think of Karim Abdul-Jabbar or you know, Cat Stevens or you know, Dave Chappelle, you know, who's a comedian. You know, he's, he happens to be Muslim or most deaf. So you know, these artists or comedians or, or others, that's just not the narrative of what you think of when you think of Islam and Muslims. You know, we're what, almost uh, somewhere between three and six million Muslims in the United States. We had less than 200 who were recruited to go and serve, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, recruited to go uh, and travel to ISIS. Most of them were young. And, and uh, I asked the, the FBI when we were on the, on the lead up to the summit, What's the profile of the people who were recruited to ISIS? They said, first of all, they're not recruited at mosques, they're recruited online. They're kind of lone wolf people. Mosques are institutions that help people become well adjusted in their American Muslim identity. These are people who are at risk. They call them, they say they have what's called a cognitive opening. They're either mentally unstable. A lot of them are converts who already are between identities. Sometimes they, they, they don't integrate well because of race issue or their uh, maybe they're part of the Somali community that are already dark-skinned, they're living in Minnesota, they're marginalized, they're poor, uneducated, et cetera. And they uh, have a grievance because of that, and then they also are recruited. They're made, made to feel part of some adventure, some brotherhood, some sisterhood. So they, they actually uh, caught three young people going over to Syria who knew nothing about Islam. In fact, they had just ordered on Amazon three weeks before they went a book literally called Islam for Dummies. They didn't know it. It's not that they, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. They're not motivated by the, they don't know anything about the religion. They are attracted because of these other things. It's not about the faith. And that's my point. But, you know, the media doesn't, doesn't cover the full story and so we don't get it. So the quest, to answer the question is, where are the Muslim voices? Google it. They're there. I mean, you, you know, Georgetown University decided to compile a list because, you know, they have a bridges program. They decided to pile, compile a list of all the condemnations. You know, it's something that we've done at the Islamic Center, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Council of American Islamic Relations. They had a press conference that night of the, uh, of the San Bernardino shooting. It was on CNN. But still, hardly anyone either sees it or remembers it or, you know, it's just, it's frustrating. I'm sorry I'm going on and on, but, you know, it's... We should borrow the Pope, I think, is what we should do. He's kind of cuddly. I like that Pope. I mean, he's like a really... Yes, yes. Someone have... If you, help us, uh, you know. What can you do? And that's what I was going to say when I first came. You know, I, 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 this, this Christian spirit is, you know, we feel your pain. We understand uh, that we have so much in common. What can we do to help? And say, well, we're kind of the new kids on the block. We don't have much infrastructure you know, uh, we, we're well adjusted, we're doing well in our respective professions, but as a religious community, we don't have, you know, we don't have a bully pulpit, we don't have a great PR firm, we don't have all, anything that you could do to help us get the message out about who we are and where we stand on these issues, we would love your help. So, what's that? All right, so we can send you all of our stuff, so, you know, we're, 
I actually run a seminary that trains, the first one in the United States that trains American Muslim imams, religious leaders. You know, that's what we do. And we're here in Claremont. And we're part of a consortium with the Claremont School of Theology and with the Christian Seminary. And so we're trying to reclaim the role of religion. We're trying to desegregate theological education, reclaim the role of religion to be a force for peacemaking in the world and not just for conflict making. So, uh, so, so we're trying our best, but we just, we're not there yet. And so any help that you can give us, we would be appreciative in that, for that effort. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jihad. Um, we have a tradition at St. James the Great, and I'm not used to holding a microphone, do anything, but we would like to um, give you a mug, and we'd like to mug and kiss you tonight. All right. From St. James the Great. <laughs> um, you also said you had not read uh, the book that we're reading by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, okay. Not in God's Name, and just a thank you card from thank all of us. So thank much. you so much for this joining us. This is very generous today. of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Next Wednesday, we have the next presentation. I don't have it. In front, I do have it in front of me right now. Um, there's been a change in dates where we'll be hearing from Lori Margaret next week about the role of uh, Christians and Muslims. So please join us next Wednesday for her presentation.